Welcome to the 243rd of the COVID Calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. I'm coming to you live from Daejeon, South Korea. Today is a discussion of decolonizing global health and the history of medicine with historian Helen Tilly. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID Calls live at its new time, weekdays, 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. Friday episodes will soon be moving to Korea time, and I'll keep you posted about those episodes, days, and times. You can also watch COVID Calls on Facebook Live, Twitch, and Periscope. You can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics. And please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. And I really do want to underline that I've been getting a lot of suggestions for people um, for themes and topics they'd like to see and suggesting themselves as experts who'd like to engage the COVID conversation. I love those suggestions and please keep them coming. As of today, March 22nd, 2021, there are 2,716,696 deaths from COVID-19 globally. That's according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. The death toll in the United States has climbed to 542,359. In South Africa, 52,111 lives have been lost to COVID-19. 2,030 deaths have been attributed to COVID-19 in Nigeria and 11,598 in Egypt. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic in some way, and I'd like to continue that now. The headline is Ex-Tribune newsman David Ibata, pioneer in online journalism and advocate for Asian American journalists, dies at 66. This was written by Bob Goldsboro and appeared in the Chicago Tribune March 16th, 2021. Over a 26-year career at the paper, David Ibata reported on real estate and transportation issues and more broadly on suburban issues at a time when the suburbs were dealing with the after effects of significant growth. And he was a strong advocate for the Chicago Tribune's move to publishing on the internet in the 1990s. He brought technological knowledge and versatility to everything he did, colleagues said. Dave was all about getting the reporting, writing, and editing straight, and he never let up, said ChicagoPublicSquare.com publisher Charlie Meyerson, a senior web producer and Daywatch columnist for the Tribune from 1998 till 2009. That he and I worked side by side as part of the small ChicagoTribune.com team for years. And I didn't know until his death that he and I shared passions for Lord of the Rings and Star Trek speaks to just how focused he was on the mission, he said. David Ibata, age 66, died of COVID-19 on January 26th. 2021 at a hospital in Marietta, Georgia, said his wife, Patty, a Kennesaw, Georgia resident. Ibata previously had lived in Arlington Heights, Illinois. Born in Chicago, Ibata grew up in the city's Edgewater neighborhood and graduated from Sen High School. After graduating from Southern Illinois University with a journalism degree, Ibata took a reporting job at the suburban Daily Herald newspaper where he eventually covered real estate. He really excelled in every job he did whether it was reporting or various editing roles, said former Tribune reporter John Hilkovich. The thing that impressed me about him was just his breadth of knowledge. He was a walking encyclopedia. Whether it was transportation, politics, sports, or city history, he'd come up with these interesting historical details about something and you'd go back, check it out, and sure enough, Dave Ibotta was right on the mark. Owen Youngsman, a former Tribune editor and executive who oversaw the launch, of the Tribune's internet business in the late 1990s, who called a February 1990 series that Ibotta worked on with another reporter, Blair Kamen, examining suburban traffic gridlock. It was a terrific series that remains good reading today, Youngman said. David was the kind of journalist who set examples for others through his attention to detail and his determination to never stop learning. Former Tribune reporter Marla Donato recalled Ibata's straightforward approach to working with people. 
Donato also recalled Ibata's embracing of personal technology, including his ordering of a gateway personal computer early on. He appeared very conservative, but when it came to technology, he was quite avant-garde, she said. He saw and embraced before most of us knew how useful and ubiquitous personal computers would be in our daily lives. In the early 1990s, Ibata began sharpening his reporting focus with an emphasis on covering area-wide transportation stories. That meant reporting frequently about various tollway expansion projects, about the PACE bus system, and about the Metra commuter rail system. In 1994, Ibata was promoted to be a deputy suburban bureau chief overseeing the Tribune's coverage of Lake, McHenry, and Northwest Cook counties. He helped to launch the paper's zoned suburban edition for McHenry County, and he assigned stories and managed a cadre of freelance reporters. Ibata returned to reporting in 1999 when he took on a new role as a suburban affairs reporter. For the next two years, he wrote extensively on topics like suburban sprawl, regional planning, and affordable housing. Ibata also was a strong advocate for providing opportunities to young Asian American journalists in Chicago. With longtime WLS Channel 7 news anchor Linda Yu, Ibata in 1989 co founded the Chicago chapter of the Asian American Journalists Association, and he was the chapter's first president. Now retired from ABC 7, Yu recalled Ibata's efforts in helping to create the group's Chicago chapter and how he never wanted any recognition for that work. He was relentless about everything, and he saw he was very serious minded. If he said yes to it, he threw himself into it, Yu said. There's so many young people who don't have a clue of the groundwork he laid. He did whatever you asked of him, and he was not a guy who sought credit for the things he did. After leaving the Tribune in 2007, Ibata moved to Atlanta to take a job at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, where he was an online editor and a copy editor from 2007 till 2012. He then was the paper's assistant opinion editor until 2015 when he left the paper. From 2016 until his death, Ibata worked as the editorial coordinator for the Salvation Army's Southern Spirit newsletter. Outside of work, Ibata enjoyed reading, following railroads and history, and was a big fan of Star Trek, Star Wars, and the Lord of the Rings trilogy, his wife said. Through his interest in railroads, Ibata was a foundation board member of the Southern Museum of Civil War and Locomotive History in Kennesaw. 2013 until 2015. In addition to his wife, Ibata is survived by a son, Andy, two daughters, Betsy Ibata and Karen Larson, and two grandchildren. Okay, I'd like to turn to my conversation today, one I've really been looking forward to. Let me introduce my guest, Helen Tilly. Helen Tilly is a professor of history at Northwestern University. Her book, Africa as a Living Laboratory, Empire, Development, and the Problem of Scientific Knowledge appeared with Chicago in 2011. This book explores the dynamic interplay between scientific research and imperialism in British Africa between 1870 and 1950. The book received the Ludwig Fleck Prize from the Society for the Social Studies of Science in 2014. She's also written articles and book chapters on the history of ecology, Eugenics, Agriculture, and Epidemiology in Tropical Africa, and is co-editor with Robert Gordon of Ordering Africa, Anthropology, European Imperialism, and the Politics of Knowledge, which appeared in 2007, and another book with Michael Gordon and Kian Prakash of Utopia Dystopia, Historical Conditions of Possibility, which appeared with Princeton Press in 2010. Her current project focuses on the history of African decolonization, global governance, and the ethno-scientific projects that accompanied state building in the colonial and Cold War era. At Northwestern, she directs science and human culture and holds a faculty fellowship with the Buffett Institute for Global Studies. She's also affiliated with the programs in African Studies, Global Health, Legal Studies, and Environmental Policy and Culture. Helen Tilly, thank you so much for making time to join me on COVID Calls today. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. And I'll quickly say, oh my gosh, my, my website is out of date. My colleague, oh. Ken Alder, now directs Science and Human Culture. Um, so we tag team. I, I stepped off to about a year and a half ago. Uh, shout out to Ken. And yeah. uh, also glad you maybe you have a little more time to write, not doing that <laughs> responsibility. But it sounds from your bio, you have a lot of other things going. Um, we have so much to cover and you've been so active in this time. Uh, let me just, um, first of all, I know that before you entered the historical profession, um, you had a, a background 
uh, as an activist. And I wonder if we could talk about that background a little bit, because I think it informs sort of your topic selections and the way you go about your research. So can you tell us a little bit about that background and how those experiences shaped your priorities in your work? Sure. I mean, and of course, the older you get, the more you realize what was and wasn't formative in your life. And you see the kind of deep seated grooves that developed uh, in your childhood and, and adolescence that shaped you in ways at the time you're not, you're not really aware of. I mean, I, I grew up in a really political family um, with, where, with a mother who had a strong background in direct action organizing um, with SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, and as a, a kind of ally to members of SNCC, uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And on the periphery in the 1960s, around 1966, 67, with some of the founding members of the Black Panther Party. Um, and these, this was kind of family lore growing up, but, but in practice, you know, we were always talking about politics. We were talking about gender issues. Um, what I would today call kind of the broad spectrum of Marxism's um, socialist ideologies and principles um, and critical analysis that I would later come to, to explore. My first article is actually on the Frankfurt School in critical theory um, because I wanted to understand some of the different routes uh, that Marxism took and, and the environmental inflections that Marxism took in the 20th century. Um, but my, even my first job in high school was with the Public Interest Research Group um, in Florida, and I did door-to-door -door, um, campaigning around offshore oil drilling, and this was in the 1986, you know, so it was early, early days. Um, mm -hmm. And in college, I got to know a group, I went to the University of Chicago, and I got to know a group called Midwest Academy, which is in the south side of Chicago. And it's a, an organizing training center. Um, and I was part of environmental groups on campus and social justice groups at the University of Chicago. And in my senior year, a project was coming to a head in the south side of Chicago in the Woodlawn community for the university to create a hazardous waste inf um, incinerator in the neighborhood. Um, so the group I was directing on campus, you know, a small little group of environmentalists, we joined forces with the Woodlawn organization um, and helped them block the placement of an incinerator in their neighborhood and also do an environmental audit of the University of Chicago um, and its waste streams, all on a voluntary basis, but very much um, part of a kind of legacy of Saul Alinsky style direct action organizing. And then when I finished college, I went right into student environmental organizing with a group I had been a part of. It was called the Student Environmental Action Coalition, uh, SEEK. And through that work, got connected to other kinds of student and youth movements um, and ended up spending about three years on the board or four years on the board of a group called Youth Action, which is based in Albuquerque, New Mexico around um, thinking about movement-based organizing and how young people not college-bound might be really interested in changing the conditions of their lives so that, um, particularly around class, ethnicity, region in the United States, so people non-college-bound can have more opportunities and that kind of student and youth work had a counterpart internationally. So I was part of a, a helped found a group with another long acronym. It was called ACEED, Action for Solidarity, Equality, Environment and Development. Um, and we were a network of young mm -hmm. organizers from around the world. And we deliberately formed as a network because we knew that it was very easy for people in wealthier countries to dominate. Um, and we didn't want to be an organization. We wanted to be a network in which priorities could be set in different parts of the world. And we had people working in the Caribbean and Latin America, um, across you know, East and West Africa in South Asia and Southeast Asia and East Asia. So we were in, in Europe and North America, we were a network of young activists who coalesced around the Earth Summit. 
that was taking place in Rio in 1992. And it was through that work that I started getting exposed to critiques of empire in a more substantive way, a policy way, you know, that experts, um, particularly in M European empires, had run roughshod over um, people's knowledge and um, land and property relations. And I already knew a lot of the history of settler colonialism because I was born in Hawaii on Oahu. Um, and we lived there twice when I was growing up until I was four and then we moved back for eighth and ninth grades. And I was exposed to sovereignty movements at a very young age, um, which has a really strong musical component. And my mom's a musician, so she was a drummer <laughs> for one wow. of the bands. She wow. drummed with um, the Beamer Brothers, who are famous Hawaiian musicians. Um, you know, and it was all, again, very impromptu. So this was sort of the, the stuff mm -hmm. of my childhood, um, sovereignty movements and awareness of settler colonialism and awareness of the U.S. as a, as a as a geopolitical superpower and a desire to understand the roots of those dynamics and address them at various scales um, mm -hmm. as an organizer. And the organizers are really um, trained to put their ego um, aside and facilitate things that don't necessarily benefit an individual, but always benefit a collective. Um, and as I describe that, you might hear like, wow, that actually doesn't mesh as well with forms of professional identity that are very individual driven, you know, mm -hmm. individual accomplishments, sure. individual authorship, you know, individual career ladders. Um, so I, when I went into academia, I started my PhD at UC Berkeley in the history of science. I actually never talked about my activist work. I was embarrassed, not embarrassed, I wasn't embarrassed by it, but I, I was quite aware um, that it was not legible as mm. important to the, my professors because of the field I was in. There were many people at Berkeley who might've thought, wow, this is important. I mean, I, I was a young person. I had already spoken at one of the preparatory committee meetings at the UN, I spoke twice at the UN during the Earth Summit preparations, a friend, of, close friend of mine, we got onto the delegation as a student representative of the US delegation, Michael Dorsey. Um, so we, we had strategized quite effectively to deal with certain things leading up to the Earth Summit, um, both in the US and transnationally. And yet, as I trained, I knew it didn't matter. I knew, you know, historians, very few historians in Berkeley's history department, I knew thought what I did was important. And of course, there's a, a cautionary note methodologically with historians of be careful of presentism, be careful of trends, be careful of, of letting the politics of the contemporary moment over determine your past interests, which are cautionary notes I take seriously and took seriously. So I considered my trial by fire at Berkeley, <laughs> and it was yeah. trial by fire, um, useful. But it always ran um, counter to a lot of the things I had learned. Um, and I ended up transferring to Oxford for my PhD because I found um, I got a one year Fulbright to go to Oxford. And as soon as I arrived, I felt I was meeting people who understood my intellectual project in ways I hadn't experienced. Um, in the 1990s in a very specific context um, at Berkeley. And so I transferred to Oxford and finished my PhD there. But even there, I remember I, I interviewed for a few fellowships. I was an unfunded graduate student. I always had two or three jobs. Mm. <laughs> I sold puppies. <laughs> I waited tables. Um, even at Oxford, I remember um, I had fabulous professors, but I remember one of them saying, you know, can you tone it down on the activism? We get it. We get that that's your background. but. You know, I think I ruled myself out for a few fellowships because I I was more open at Oxford than I had been at, at Berkeley. And I think um, it's always about can you can you the, the proof is in the pudding in scholarship, you know, what have you done in your written work? So people were just waiting for me to do my dissertation and see is there any there there. Um, 
and and so that's always been a tension for for me around my eight years of background as a as an organizer and trainer of organizers and a facilitator of movement building in different parts of the world and then as a scholar and i have a very contemplative side so i appreciate the gray zone of scholarship a lot and i didn't always find that it was so easy to live in a gray zone as an organizer and activist for understandable reasons but well, i'm really glad that you sort of sketched out that that background and maybe a little later in the conversation we'll kind of come to some changes that you see in the historical profession today i'm trained as a historian of science myself mm -hmm. and um uh i don't have i don't have the background that you do in in activism and organizing but i can certainly agree with you. I mean, there were other students who came from other backgrounds, some from journalism and some from activism. And it wasn't that there was hostility to it, but exactly as you said, it just was illegible to the training. And, um, you know, that concern that you're sort of somehow too much of the world, um, right. which might influence the way that you operate in the archives or something. And I, and I think it's, all of this is really relevant to um, the posture of the historical profession, broadly speaking at this time because COVID is so much more than a single pandemic. It's it's a compound set of disasters that's revealing the need um, mm -hmm. for, I think, historians to get in the game, if you'll pardon a sports metaphor. And I, I think that's, so understanding how you come to this work, I think is, is really crucial. Now you wrote, um, among many things, you've published Africa as a Living Laboratory, which is a great book and everybody should be aware of, of this book. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit, um, maybe about how you see that work now in mm -hmm. in light of in light of covid I, I love to ask this question of of historians because we're always sort of revising our own works i think to a certain extent but sometimes these disasters do throw our work in a new light i wonder if you've had that um uh, experience at all yeah i mean i'm i'm on i have mixed feelings about the book um i mean on the one hand it was a labor of love it was a project that i sacrificed a lot for um, I wanted my dissertation to be more like what the book is, um, but when I, Oxford has a three to four year time limit on how long you can spend writing a dissertation, wisely so. Um, I, I mean, I'm not a, I don't think that's a, a bad thing necessarily, but when I um, presented my dissertation prospectus, I had two imperial historians um, examine me, one who focused more on Africa and one who focused more on the British Empire, and they said, your proposal is too big. And so there's no way you could do it in two more years because you and you interview at the end of your first year. So cut it down, which I did. And I wrote a decent dissertation. But once I'd finished the dissertation, I went back to my, well, here's the bigger vision that I had. I really wanted to understand the scramble for Africa. I really wanted to understand also the watershed moment after the Second World War. Um, and I, I, I wanted to have many moving parts. I'm, a, I'm, I'm one of those people um, who tends to take on projects that have, you know, ten thousand puzzle pieces. You know, so I know as a kind of quantalist, you know, there are these different dots I'm trying to connect. And I, when I start going about my research, it's impressionistic for sure, but there, there are parts that I want to explore because I'm, I recognize from my reading that there might be things, dots that aren't being connected. So when I did my training in graduate school, I trained in the history of science, I trained in environmental history. My second, uh, my outside field in graduate school was actually sociology, and when I got uh, that, I was examined in. And then when I got to Oxford, I also trained in anthropology. So I had various fields I had been reading, and then my research was in African imperial history and taking on development studies and economics. So there was no shortage of sort of pitfalls and. Um, challenges to to address and i did keep getting advised along the way write two books you know that would be better for your career <laughs> write it faster that would be better for your career <laughs> both of which were very true you know and i and for reasons that are stubbornness 
Um, I wanted to live up to my intellectual vision, but also reasons of out of sheer intellectual curiosity. Because I did have in my, the back of my mind, I may only write one book in my lifetime. When I was writing it, you never, you don't know if you're going to get a job. You don't know. I mean, I was employed, but I, it was precarious, and I did get turned down for tenure at Princeton. So I, I finished the book in limbo. I had no permanent job. I was moving from assistant, um, visiting assistant professor posts to two different schools, Birkbeck and UW Madison, and I had been guardian of a, my little brother who's now in his 30s. So I was raising my little brother at Princeton and I'm also a single parent. You know, so you're living, <laughs> you're living your life. And um, I just wanted to write a book that dealt with environment, medicine, anthropology, race, development, empire, and see how the things fit together. And I knew from my research that there were lots of unexpected twists and turns that some ideas that I ca I thought of as kind of critiques of empire that came from outside empire were actually deeply rooted within imperial dynamics. And so I suddenly had to make sense of epistemological approaches uh, to development, bottom-up approaches, ecologically sensitive approaches, ethnographically sensitive approaches that could still be autocratic at their roots. Um, so don't get me wrong. I mean, but I, I began to see that weaker states in particular, and many colonial states in Sub-Saharan Africa were weaker, had many different kinds of projects that were grounded in scientific field work that weren't often seen even by people who said they were interested in science, medicine, and race. And I began to see these patterns because they were happening on a smaller scale and so they weren't that legible to people working on a single place. And they were crossing regions. So they also weren't legible if you worked on a single place. If something came in and out quickly, it just, you know, it was kind of a flash in the pan. Whereas I would trace its movement and see, oh, wow, this, this shines a new light on it. Um, so I taught the book for the first time this year in a grad seminar. I've never uh, assigned it. I don't. I assigned chapters in draft form when I was at Princeton, but I'd never assigned the book in a grad seminar before, and I was underwhelmed. <laughs> I was I was a little bored with myself, <laughs> and that's I think a healthy sign that you have moved on. You, you've left you've you've left the world, the results of your labors. It, it reads to me now as um, rather constricted um, politically because I was so afraid of pushback on certain topics. Um, and, you know, I was trying to satisfy and anticipate critics. So I, I see the choices I was making. I'm not disappointed with it. I think it stands up well over time. But uh, naturally enough, I've moved on. Well, let's talk a, a little bit about, um, I mean, you've been very busy through this time and, and even published a piece in Somatosphere that I just want to bring to people's attention um, with the title, Traditional Chinese Medicine in a Time of COVID-19, Cold War Origin Stories and the WHO's Role in Making Space for Polyglot Therapeutics. And I'm just going to quote a sentence from this, which I think really I'd like to talk with you about, you say, no part of the world has been left untouched by the epidemiological aftermath of empire building and economic production. The globalization of disease and the history of pandemics are rooted in these forces. Likewise, no part of the world has been left untouched by the colonizing logics of medicine. The COVID-19 pandemic needs to be situated within these wider histories. Now, this piece is about um, the so-called traditional Chinese medicine kind of controversies. And we were hearing about those very early mm -hmm. in the pandemic. They have a much deeper history, as you point out in the piece. But to this more general point around, you know, the news flashing around on our screen about pandemic. Um, and once again, I think Africa has been mostly missing from, from these headlines. Um, but you're pointing us here to a, a set of questions that we, I think, if I've got you right, need to be constantly engaged with. Um, and that decolonization is not something that um, sort of ends when a country gets its independence from Britain or France or whoever they get it from. It's this ongoing, ongoing process. 
Um, right. And as a way to understand, to make some sense of what we're seeing with, with the pandemic, with COVID-19. So I wonder if you'd like to talk about the piece a little bit and then a little bit more broadly around decolonization. Yeah, I mean, this is an opportunity um, to acknowledge the work of others, uh, too. I mean, I, I started to write the piece because um, I had seen Alondra Nelson put out the call for um, a pandemic curriculum. Um, and she was gathering and many other people at a kind of uh, open sourcing, um, you know, how to teach disease, how to teach pandemics. Um, so I was, I wrote it with a, uh, with a mindset of teaching, um, and I love to teach and this tragedy, I think, and I'll just editorialize for a moment, the tragedy of the way, you know, research universities are organized today where we do so much service and ad administer so much. We, we do, are expected to do constant research and be productive in publishing and we have, you know, usually a full course load. Um, I think teaching gets short shrift, and uh, it's teaching that helps break down some of the boundaries that can inhibit thinking carefully and creatively about, you know, I use Peter Taylor's title, unruly complexity. You know that uh, now he's an ecologist um, who has written about social theory and and environmental theory um, together, and I so I wrote that piece because I was also do I'm writing a book on the history of of the concept of traditional medicine and the legal status uh, that it it developed over the course of the 20th century, and so it's also an opportunity to shout out to um, Marta Hansen who engaged with me behind the scenes. Um, and she's a, a fa fabulous medical historian who has worked on, on ep concepts of epidemics in China, um, warm and hot diseases, traditional healing. And she has also worked on the first SARS epidemic um, in 2002 to 04. Um, so engaging with a little in a little behind the scenes conversation and also with my East Asian historians of China, Peter Carroll and Melissa McCauley, I thought, OK, I'm going to wade into this conversation using the Chinese medicine as the hook, because, as you may know, um, the Chinese state and different research institutes quickly began to translate their diagnostic and treatment protocols. So by the end of January 2020, English language and other languages, but I read the English language ones, English language protocols coming out of Chinese research institutes in the Chinese state around diagnostic issues and treatment issues relating to COVID-19 were circulating. Hmm. And historians of science trace circulation. So it was interesting to me to watch treatment protocols develop in the United States with very little reference to treatment protocols in other places, that kind of hermetically sealed state boundary um, doing its work of preventing important information from coming in from other parts of the world, in part because it's still inflected, in my view, um, with the properties of, of Cold War, I will use a loaded term, Cold War hysteria around um, more socially centered approaches to medicine and health versus um, profit centered approaches to medicine and health. And I saw in the treatment protocols coming out of China, a sensitivity to a far broader spectrum of issues than I was seeing coming out of the United States. And I should mention that I was based in Cambridge, England um, for the first, I guess, eight months, nine months of the pandemic, only returning uh, to Evanston, Illinois in mid-August of 2020. So I was kind of triangulating it, watching it in China and East Asia, then watching it in Italy and across Europe, watching it in, in, in the UK, um, and then watching it in, in the United States. And I wanted to write that piece um, as well because I, I was noticing, and this is where I feel like two issues around pharmaceuticals have been um, radically truncated. 
um, the treatment protocols about what medications to give people to ward off transition to a more acute phase of COVID were being oddly ignored in more mainstream journalistic conversations, not among medical humanists, not among scholars, but when we started talking about, um, and you know, Trump made his hydroxychloroquine, um, you know, gaffe or advocacy, however you want to put it, or misdirection, um, it was, you know, for those of us who study what drugs people are being given, there's a wide array of, of treatments that can help, including nutrition, that can help people not become acute, acutely sick with something. Right. And, right. and I watched that unfold and, and realized, again, that there was a kind of capitalist elision at work, you know, where issues of nutrition were, were poo-pooed and often are in capitalist-oriented countries. Um, so that, that it becomes all fad talk all the time and not, not as much about the biochemistry of nutrition. And issues of antibiotics and antivirals that might actually help in the early stages um, because of secondary infections in the case of antibiotics and, and lots of knowledge about antivirals in which there are plant therapies that are largely healthy, you know, not safe, I should say safe, um, so not dangerous, but not necessarily as um, targeted or effective as you might get with certain pharmaceuticals, which have all mm -hmm. these side effects. Right. Uh, so I recognize that, you know, in, in many ways, the history of plant medications um, has been relegated to um, a kind of side discussion among historians, among medical anthropologists, but in terms of practitioners, there is very little knowledge of um, how recently that relegation to the margins has been. I mean, even if you look at the World Health Organization's International Digest of um, Legislation, you see through the 1950s discussion about herbals and regulation of herbals in Italy, in the Netherlands, in, in hmm. Sweden, it was, it was relatively mainstream. I, and, and yet now it's become something that gets, I don't know, put on the margins, trivialized, minimized, and that ignorance does its own labors. If people don't know uh, that there really are 50 to 70 year research trends around the antiviral properties of certain plants and plants in combination as well and whole plants, you know, and the way they're consumed, then people will hear like, oh, they're just take the herbals, you know, oh, how right. silly. And so it's very easy to minimize, trivialize, marginalize, and it's, it's ignorant it's anti-intellectual, but it also serves a purpose. And it even serves a, a purpose among elite doctors who are unwilling to explore some of their own blind spots and translate across cultures mm -hmm. and think about cost. Um, so all of those kinds of things come up in the conversation. And that's what prompted me to write it um, as a thinking piece that should be a dialogue. I, I like things that, um, I, this is why I like Somatosphere, and I'll, I'll just say Eugene Rakel and, and his collaborators have done a marvelous job of having real-time conversations about important issues and featuring them on Somatosphere, and your work on COVID calls is doing a similar thing in terms of both talking about and recording in real-time conversations that are happening. And I think scholars need more of that, not less. Um, and, and including a willingness to put things that are less fully thought out and less critique, like that wasn't peer reviewed. I had a couple of colleagues read it um, and they gave me some important feedback, but you know, it's not like yeah, I right. could say that's a peer reviewed piece or I'm fully satisfied with every point I've made. I mean, I would rewrite it differently today, but the point was to get it into a conversation.
I'm glad that you mentioned Alondra Nelson there too, because the Social Science Research Council, um, and full disclosure, I've been working on one of these uh, essay series uh, with uh, mm -hmm. Alexa Dietrich um, on disaster studies. And I mean, we started this work back in, in March and, and it was, you know, opening a space for scholars to bring out ideas that they wanted to work with, that the idea also that they could go back and work with them more, that this mm -hmm. disaster is moving at a kind of uneven temporality. And the idea that you would know right away exactly what to make of it, well, right. that's not relevant, but also that you should just sit patiently by and just wait till it's somehow over to bring right. the knowledge to bear that we have to contribute, that's not the right approach either. And so I do think these intermediate spaces and somatospheres, tremendous in, in this, are really important spaces. Just a reminder that you're listening to COVID calls and I'm talking to Helen Tilly today. I wanna to stay with this um, traditional Chinese medicine case too, because um, I, you trace it back to the Cold War and at the same time, we saw it playing out in real time in January and February that China was I mean, such a blunt political instrument that the Trump administration, and not only the Trump administration, but particularly the Trump administration was using to undermine, to take the heat off of themselves for early failures that they were aware of. Um, mm -hmm. And that one of the ways they did that was to say, well, China has obscured, they have, um, you know, work the numbers, they're trying to work the refs at the WHO. And by the way, and this was not, you know, random comments, I see these as strategic comments, that, you know, their approach to medicine in China is also not correct. And so we can't, so it was this invoking of all of this language that you're talking about, yeah. which brings racism right to the center of it. Yeah. Because it, it goes beyond just saying, well, here's some clinical trials that come out of China and we should think about those in context of this. It was dismiss all of it mm -hmm. because it comes from this backwards place, which is now also, by the way, giving us, I won't say the things Trump said, but is bringing the virus to us. It was so strong. Mm -hmm. And I think your historical reading of it and grounding it in this history is, is exactly what we needed in that moment. But I think we still need it. It feels like with the vaccine, maybe almost again, we've kind of moved on past that uncertain moment where there were many different treatment options and nobody could say certainly what the right one was. So I, I guess that was all in your head as you were sitting down to write this piece too. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I, I'm I sort of, a, in a weird way, I'm a generalist, um, which means I know a lot about a little. And, and that's why when I see sort of, I hear things happening, um, I, I, I have a sense of, oh, I know where that's coming from because I've read a little about that. And when I've read a little about it, I know where to look to find a lot more. And I think I've been willing to, to walk that tightrope of my own ignorance all my career um, so that I'm not ever trying to quite literally capitalize on, on a thing I already do well, but I'm always willing to move on to another you know, shifting sands in a way. I mean, the, t there are two things I would say in terms of your comments about um, the executive branch and the role of the US president. Uh, I mean, one thing is I think from day one, there was obstruction to a coordinated response. And I have not seen enough um, analysis that makes that point on a fine grained way. I mean, the briefings in the United States started in January, January 3rd, January 4th. By the end of January, January 23rd, when you had the, the shutdown of Wuhan, the briefings were already, I mean, the United States gets the most information of any country in the world in real time. So to pretend otherwise is already playing the game of commentators. What did they know? I couldn't, we can't be sure. Oh my goodness, it must have been, they, they're just incompetent. No, they were not incompetent. They were getting information in real time and they deliberately obstructed things for political purposes. And I would wish to God, now <laughs> this is why I'll never get another job again. I wish more people would say that because we need that fine grained historical analysis to show that there was absolute obstruction. And a good case in point is when they trumpet that they closed the borders with China. 
And if they were serious about that, and that could have been a very serious kind of, um, you know, a move that a lot of epidemiologists say might not work, it might not do anything. I mean, there's a, a lot of good debate about border closure, closures and what it does. But when they, when the, I think it was January 3rd, um, around closing the borders to travel from China with many exceptions, mayors with international airports reached out and said, how do we implement this? Help us implement this. And just by chance, a colleague of mine at, at Northwestern, Peter Slevin, interviewed Lori Lightfoot as the mayor of Chicago. And she said, I could not get a straight answer. And I knew we were on our own. And that is a very telling statement to make as a mayor. And she was coordinating with the mayors of New York, of LA, of San Francisco, I think maybe of um, Houston, it might, might even one city in Texas. So mayors were trying to coordinate around travel wisely. And then, as you know, governors were also trying to coordinate and they were obstructed. And that obstruction and distraction um, was something that people have lived through uh, during the Trump administration for four years. So it's a familiar playbook. Um, and it's part of, a, of the, the racial demonization is a familiar playbook. I mean, the phrase racial fascism is one that is apt. I mean, these are things that historians recognize. Like, you know, we've seen this before. Right. And not just have we seen this before, but we, we know the legal precedents that are being drawn upon and they come out of 19th century immigration controls and they come out of the history of the eugenics movement. They come out of vilification and stereotyping of populations in order to divide people, in order not to meet people's needs. So, I mean, you see all this happening and you want you want more historical fine-grained analysis, not less. The other thing that really I think um, I wanted to address, and I still have mixed feelings about, um, I started to see all the compilations of vaccines and vaccine development. Um, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine kept a database, I think still does keep a database of, of dozens of trials hundreds of trials. And I, a big, partly because I'm not in a historian of pharmaceuticals, strictly speaking, per se, like that's my, that's not my specialization. Um, if people are doing good real-time analysis of the breadth of those trials, I haven't seen it, but we need it. We desperately need to step back and forget about the superstar vaccines and, and reconstruct the story of all the vaccine trials, mm. because that story will help us make sense of the things that people have been lifting out and saying, okay, we're now living through an era of vaccine apartheid. The patent waivers are not being allowed in the World Trade Organization. We have these you know, Mercedes-Benz vaccines like Moderna and Pfizer, um, and then the AstraZeneca, is that, a, is that a subpar vaccine? What's the status of it? And that is an important conversation, but the broader context is still missing. And I would love to see that too, um, which I know, you know, this is when you really need multinational teams working in real time. There's so much in what you were just describing. Let me take the second part first, because I was just listening to an interview um, yesterday with uh, Dr. Fauci, mm -hmm. and he, and this is not to fault him at, at all. I would not, I'm not in that business, but he, um, he was asked about vaccine and he said, oh, um, we're back to where we needed to be. And the United States has given $4 billion um, to COVAX, and we are back in the lead now leading the world in the charge to provide vaccine to middle and low income, he didn't say developing, but low income and middle income countries. And at the, one in the same time, I felt a sense of, oh, well, this feels very familiar and this feels good to hear those words from a, from a physician in leadership in the United States. And then of course you feel that, that chill down the back of your spine when you think of all of that sort of the historical freight that that, that, that brings, that it has to be the United States and Europe, bringing the wealth to the countries who could not possibly do this 
on their own. I don't know if you heard that interview, but you know, just to tap mm-hmm. into some of this vaccination discussion you're talking about. So now all of the complexity that you've just been calling for over the last 16 months, it's getting flattened. And we're watching it happen in real time because we reached the techno fix and now it's time to save America and save the world. And yes, that's true on the face of it, but you go one millimeter below that and and we have been living through this this struggle where the United States has not been leading in that regard. It's just how it's been framed. Right. I mean, I think, and this is the double-edged sword of governance. Um, you know, I mean, they're, they're in a lot of um, humanist circles, it's important to identify the dangers of state power and state violence. And we've seen that in many countries, the abuse of state power, the use of state violence, instruments of state violence to suppress social movements, to murder people, um, to foment racial divides, ethnic divides, xenophobia. So we we have, again, we have a a sociological and historical understanding and ethnographic understanding of of the dangers of states and political science, Uh, but governance can also push back against this. And there's certain, I mean, this is when you get into the reality of an interdependent world, border crossing problems, massive inequalities of power, state and otherwise, economic power, this power of the platform, power of certain instruments. And so in a, in a situation where you have a pandemic that actually with coordinated popular um, agency can be addressed in remarkable ways without the expensive techno fixes. I mean, if you think about the amount invested in the vaccines, it's truly remarkable that some parts of the world and some groups of people have organized to respond collectively without as much misinformation as there has been in more powerful states like Brazil or the United States, um, without the showboating and grandstanding and kind of authoritarian leaning political parties. And that helps you understand that there are low cost options. Mm -hmm. There are um, systematic approaches that are not too mysterious. And I, 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 the one thing I, I've seen is people, I've seen the kind of popular take of, we're fighting this pandemic with tools that we've had for hundreds of years, you know, how backwards is that? And that's precisely the kind of thinking that to me is crazy talk, but people sure. get to say it all the time. I mean, when when you don't have misinformation and you have a populace that takes infectious diseases seriously and where in the world do people take infectious diseases seriously where they experience infectious diseases on a regular basis i mean and i will digress i took part in a panel in the fall in my department with two fantastic colleagues and one of them said both historians and one of them said we are not used to infectious diseases and I and he was talking in global terms. He was not saying we Europeans, and he's a European mm, historian, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. we in the United States. He was saying we the world. And that collapsed, and just that offhanded remark that collapsed so many parts of the world into a in a kind of singular perspective that to me also. How could you possibly think that and talk and write about disease anywhere in the world? <laughs> you know, I just, I kind of go, wait, wait, where, who? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not the only, I mean, there's so many scholars, sure. particularly in African studies who make this point. Um, I wanted to mention Nanjala Nayabola's work because she has an article out in The Nation just today on the vaccine controversy, but she's also written um, compelling ar- articles for The Nation and for Boston Review one of which is headed, you know, Africans are not waiting to be saved. Um, That's the title. And, you know, she makes a a really important point about generational experiences, not just with Ebola, which is the one that kind of gets to our shores in the United States, Mm -hmm. but with HIV AIDS. Mm 
I mean, I have sat in so many seminars that discuss HIV AIDS and its history um, and start in California. How can you tell a history of HIV AIDS or start in New York? And, and the, even that tendency about where, where did HIV begin? How do we know its impact? What parts of the world are most affected? Is there ge accumulated generational insight that that can then respond generationally to a pandemic. You know, that's why I did write a piece um, in which I looked at some of the more quotidian ways of spreading information about COVID-19, about hand washing, about mask wearing. Um, and, you know, it's not that I would say so many people are compliant in wearing masks. I just think it's much more widely accepted in many parts of the world that masks work. Yeah. And the manufacturing of a debate around masks also struck me as weird. <laughs> what, you know, where did this debate come from? And it's ongoing. I mean, that, as you know, in terms of the uh, dissident theorists around how the United States should have responded, there is this subtext around masks doing harm and, mm -hmm. the, and the efficacy of masks. So. I mean, I think, again, that that manufacturing of a dissident perspective um, that becomes a useful piece of misinformation and disinformation is also important to, to document. I, just to pick up on one thing you said, and thank you for sharing that story about being in the seminar and, and the use of the pronouns and that slippage, the, the we here when we talk about the pandemic um, is problematic and, and should you know, it's a simple thing maybe, but it actually really surfaces a lot of um, assumptions that people make because it's a global phenomenon, then we assume it's a sort of global, it's a it's a world that's all in this somehow together, which is, um, it's not the way that governance works, it's not the way that law works, and it's not the way that culture mm -hmm. works. I wanna turn in a second to some of the recent work you've been doing about um, global medical cultures and, and law. Mm -hmm. I wanna come to that, but just um, one other thing, I mean, I'm in South Korea right now, and I tell you in the last couple of weeks and talking with friends and family back in the United States, the number one question I get asked is, have you, you of course you've been vaccinated. Um, I said, no, I haven't. Um, the vaccination, you know, the South Korean government is moving forward with their vaccination procedures. But the reality is I get a text message every time, I'm in a city of 1.5 million people, I get a text message every time there's a case. They've done infection control here. Right. And um, they have their own critiques. There's this own discourse about, you know, the, the costs of doing that in South Korea. But I tell you, right. the rush to the techno fix of the vaccine is not part of the public discourse the way it has been in the United States. Mm -hmm. And the victory lap that I'm seeing going on in the United States right now is distressing when you consider um, that under 2,000 people have died here in South Korea. So I just wanted to make that that point because it's an important one and ties back into what you've been saying. If you're looking at, I read some of those statistics at the top of the show. I mean, the death statistics in Nigeria, um, in sub-Saharan Africa and places that people without even looking at the stats, if you ask them on the street, they would probably say, oh, I'm sure it's terrible there. Right, and let's That's not, I mean, it, 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 again, there's always this double-edged sword because there is an enormous amount of suffering and yeah. Debility, um, to use a concept that Julie Livingston has has worked on in Botswana. I mean, the the suffering and the debility and survival and and joy in life can all go together. Uh, and and so that's you know I, I I as you know I wrote the COVID across Africa piece as part of a special issue in the Journal of West African History with three other colleagues contributing articles. And I wanted, I was walking that fine line of why don't people understand that there is a pan-African infrastructure, and I mean that quite literally, a pan-African infrastructure of multiple organizations that work across state lines and that deliberately work across state lines, in part because there is a, a dearth of infrastructure within states. There isn't, there's insufficient infrastructure. And when that pan-African infrastructure coordinates well and works well, it does has done remarkable things, things that we can critique, things that are are not are imperfect, things that can also do harm. But that 
response, that level of institutional agency is so missing from people's analysis that it, it does mean that you're always remaking the wheel. You're always telling people what they don't know, including, I mean, when I was, when I was writing that piece, I, was, I was, found it interesting that journalists from African countries who were writing for the World Economic Forum or writing for the Financial Times or writing for um, The Economist would fall into the same epistemological traps. They would make the same kinds of assumptions that were flawed, ahistorical, ignorant, um, even coming from an African country. So, I mean, it's not your identity or your nationality necessarily. It's the work you're willing to do to read, to pay attention, to understand, to take follow clues. I mean, that investigative reporting. And the sad thing for me watching, because I have no platform and I kind of like it that way. I'm sort of an introvert, extrovert. And so every time I get close to having any notoriety, I like to pull way, 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 way back and go, you guys go with that. You know, I mean, that's the nice thing about it. I just joined social media during the pandemic for the first time in my life, Twitter. Um, you know, so I have no platform, but I'll weigh in with some points. And I want you kind of want to see, I do, I want to see more people following clues. I see, I mean, I, I see things coming across my feed where I just think, wow, we should be looking into that. This should be happening. But then you, it's the same old, same old, like groups, we get into groups. Um, and I'm not, I, I sound more critical of, of my peers and myself than, than, I, than I feel because of course I recognize how many people are working in real time doing amazing things to analyze things. But I, I just wish there were, more coherence to it and that the intellectual project was what I see as the kind of full enchilada <laughs> you know <laughs> with the deep deep roots I'm using all kinds of mixed metaphors here the deep mm -hmm. roots <laughs> it's one of the things that was pointed out early in the in the pandemic um, by people particularly anthropologists pointing this out to me is they had their own you've been talking about this sort of knife's edge you know and I think it, the metaphor works here too that um, they were desperate to get to various field sites. They were desperate to get back into the places where that knowledge that you've just been describing about these sort of, let's say, um, pandemic preparedness and response communities and networks across Africa. They were those sites in the middle of this pandemic, but they couldn't. And then they also realized um, at that time, the sort of their own shortcoming of this approach that we have in the Western Academy is that that knowledge can't be made until I get there. Right. And, I, and, I, and I, that's not everyone, but I think we've had to take a hard look at that too. Mm -hmm. And that maybe one of the after effects of the pandemic in terms of the way that the kind of work that you and I are involved in is we probably just, we need to work a lot harder um, to make sure that these networks are really strong in regular times mm -hmm. and that to the extent that they can be funded um, outside of the United States or outside of Europe, they should be. Uh, right. But waiting for I'm Western scholars to show up in Africa and tell us what the pandemic, what COVID-19 meant in Nigeria is not the right way to approach this. Right. The, do you, I mean, that's where, you know, there are two things I learned from organizing. Um, one is decentralized modes of power. Uh, can be incredibly important to leveraging change. Um, and and I, I, I am often uncomfortable with tactics being mistaken for strategies in social movements where, you know, demonstrations and public facing activities get mistaken for the sum total of what it, what, social, radical social change might look like. I mean, organizing is a lot about base building. It's a lot about flexing your imaginative muscles so you can really imagine things as different, radically different. Um, I can imagine universities as radically different entities. I can imagine history departments doing very different things with the skill sets we currently have. 
I can imagine reward systems being very different um, and um, privileging a kind of knowledge. I mean, you work in disaster studies, privileging kinds of expertise, kinds of um, facilitation processes that are more procedural that would really revolutionize the flow of information, resources, skills, analysis, and decenter it. I mean, we have incredible concentrations of wealth in U US universities, UK, European universities, and it's crazy. I mean, it's tragic. You know, it's, it's, it's outrageous. If you go, you know, the University of Abaddon, where I worked a few years ago, you go to their library, the lights are off, the books are off the shelves, but then you go to their archives and they have amazing materials that we can still access that need better preservation, where the students there are accustomed to working their way around the lack of resources. And then I return to my own university that's building yet another athletics stadium, that yet another upgrade to a building, yet another, you know, global studies effort where we can be thought leaders. And the contradictions and the hypocrisy can't, can't you know, help but strike you in the face. I mean, if you care about these kinds of inequalities, it strikes you in the face all the time. And my own training, and one of the reasons I, I kind of look slow on paper, I'm less productive in some ways than people my age, um, is because I, I, I have a kind of set of rules for myself of what I give and what I get. And I, I take those rules very seriously. They're private, they're mine. You know, I, I don't tell my bosses of what are those rules are. I, you know, I was willing to get turned down for tenure because of some of those rules, but I can live with myself because of those rules. And I wish our universities took that kind of ethics more seriously. We sign conflict of interest statements um, annually, but we don't sign statements about our commitment to, to real equity, not managerial equity. <laughs> Again, I'm getting myself into hot water. No, you're not. You're, you're providing, um, you're clarifying things that I think a lot of people are feeling right now. And, and I just want to remind folks, I'm, you are listening to COVID calls. I'm talking with historian Helen Tilly today, and um, we're almost up on time, but if you indulge me, maybe we can get another question in because I know you've also been working um, in forming a new research network around global medical cultures and law, and it taps back to sort of our earlier conversation around borders. And it is one of the, I think, um, hardest puzzles for people to sort through in real time. So we've got a global pandemic with global bodies that comment on it and try to offer information and regulate. And of course it plays out, we think at a national level and we see statistics of deaths at both levels. I read, I traffic in those statistics. Mm -hmm. um, but of course in the United States, it has sometimes been intensely local. I mean, down to you know, local medical examiner's offices and local public health offices in small places at the county level in rural areas, making life and death decisions about hospital access, med medicine access, ambulances, nebulizers, and everything else. So that movement across scale in terms of thinking about law and policy right. is a space that you're engaged in right now. And I'm really fascinated by that from a disaster mm -hmm. research point of view, because I think we don't I love that kind of work that Gabrielle Heck does in sort of challenging us to move across scale, finding vehicles to do it. Law is one of those vehicles, I think. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you're approaching that work. Yeah, and the, the, the group right now is pretty amorphous. Um, it started at Northwestern. It was funded by our um, Global Studies Institute. Um, but then that Global Studies Institute got reimagined as something else, so we were orphaned. Um, but we did manage before we were orphaned to get a special issue of OSIRIS, the History of Science Journal um, that Suman Seth and Patrick McRae edit. Um, so that we are go we're coming out this June with a special issue on that. And my collaborators work across fields. So um, I've worked with Carol Heimer as a medical sociologist who specializes also in, in law and medicine. 
and Laura Pedraza Farina, who works in patent law and global health and, and innovation and, and science. Um, Rebecca Seligman, who's a medical anthropologist who works on different, um, her first book is on Brazil and um, ideas of alternative medicine, um, candomblé and, and trance, the status of trances. Um, and most recently, because she joined the university after um, we started the project, Adia Benton has come in um, providing another important kind of global health, um, African studies, North American studies perspective, which is a more um, micro analysis. Some of her interests follow the micro analysis of like literally like what happens to um, bodily fluids and proprietary ownership over things collected during a pandemic, whether it's Ebola or um, COVID-19. But my own interest in doing this kind of work, again, has to do with living at the crossroads of fields and recognizing that a lot of people in global health are poorly trained in history. A lot of people in law and medicine with, with an emphasis on the law side are poorly trained in global history and comparative history. So they will focus on more powerful parts of the world often. Um, that there's also a disconnect in science studies and critical medical anthropology and the medical history, um, especially since both fields were developing, medical anthropology and medical history were really coming into their own in the 1940s and 50s. Um, in universities in Europe and North America. And as they came into their own, they had a division of labor around the world that really did compartmentalize parts of the world and got kind of hardwired into conceptual categories, models of what constituted public health, um, so definitions of what things were. Um, even transnational studies of germ theories of disease had a kind of division of labor um, in terms of where it mattered um, versus where it was just imported or diffused. So I started to see various patterns, um, especially around colonial state building, because if you look at a lot of colonial states and you look at, at um, laws, you see a kind of model law dynamic developing, you know, for the British Empire in particular, you know, you have the colonial office and the foreign office and the dominion office, all kind of comparing legislation at various times and legislation around pandemics, uh, contagious diseases, prostitution, medical licensing, um, and then criminal laws around, you know, who couldn't act in certain ways. And those people who got caught up in the crosshairs of criminal laws sometimes were seen by their own societies as healers. You know, so I started to put these things together around who has the rights to heal in different times in the world, who, uh, who have, you know, how are rights to health defined? How is public health defined? What concepts of sovereignty come into play? What level of jurisdiction, which is a very spatial concept, um, unlike medical pluralism, which is a concept anthropologists use, jurisdiction is literally borders, border making, you know, and, and, and who counts where and what domain of law. And I find that putting the legal history together with medical history, with global history, with area studies, with science studies, you start to see major blind spots in scholarship. And so the volume that we're coming out with in this June has 15 different chapters exploring some of these domains. And it just so happens that some of them really do speak to the pandemic um, mm. in important ways, um, especially around cultures of care, mm. that, that there are much broader definitions of care that human beings live with day in and day out than the word medical and the way it's often defined can convey. That household care is a huge part of the history of medicine everywhere in the world, that different sovereign entities that are no longer with us, like let's take the Ottoman Empire, you know, we no longer have the Ottoman Empire, but the legacies of infrastructures for care and health of the Ottoman mm -hmm. Empire continue to influence developments in North Africa and areas of the Middle East, mm -hmm. that those, those dynamics um, matter to the way, even to the way a pandemic is approached. And they also matter in the way, 
people are willing to accept or dismiss certain types of expertise and certain types of proof and persuasion, you know, the dominance of randomized controlled trials um, and, and how you sneak into randomized controlled trials, new techniques. So I'll bring this back around to herbal medicines. Mm -hmm. You know, there are new tech, uh, tests trying to look at whole plant therapies rather than compartmentalized active agent therapies um, that have been developed over the last 20 years. I mean, this is not a new thing. It's been 20 years of, of randomized control tests looking at whole plants and multiple plants and how they function um, when they're consumed in human bodies and in, and, in humans and in, in non-human animals. And that kind of, you know, trying to get around the limits of randomized control trials can help us begin to open up broader definitions of health, of care, cultures of care, of you know multiple jurisdictions existing in any one place. And it also helps us helps remind us that the nation state is a really blunt instrument to analyze the world. I mean, if you're always using the categories of comparing nation states, you're already doing a disservice to reality. Um, though, I mean, di medical diplomacy is another part of what I study, and there's a massive um, set of stories around medical diplomacy, um, around decolonization in the Cold War that haven't yet been told, and I'm, I'm hoping are going to be told in the next 10, 20 years. Well, I'm glad you really, you talked in detail about that um, issue of Osiris, and, and just to make sure people watch for that coming out in June and your intro piece in it, Medical Cultures, Therapeutic Properties and Laws and Global History sets it up really nicely. Um, we're almost up on time, Helen. I've said that twice now, but I've, I've taken more of your time than I said I would. But um, just in closing out, um, you had shared with me that you had a, a COVID experience of, of your own. And I wonder if you might just say how you're, how you're doing right now before we close. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so, so I was in England. Um, and I think the first COVID fatality in England was around my, March 9th. And at the time I was in Cambridge and we were told that there was no COVID in Cambridge. Um, but on March 14th, I got sick. Um, and it was, you know, the tight chest. I have a history of asthma. So I, I, I've never, as an adult, I kind of grew out of asthma, but I know what it feels like to be short of breath and to um, be winded from the least exertion. So that that was something I experienced for, you know, a good week to 10 days, along with a fever. Um, and I'm, again, I'd, re I'd actually read all those diagnostic protocols. So I, you know, upped all my vitamins, I upped all my protein. I mean, when your body is under assault, you, you increase, you know, your electrolytes, um, you eat more protein. Uh, and I never got that sick. Um, I, I was sick for about a month, but I never got that mm. sick, um, nor did I ever get a test. So mm. I had recognizable, you know, the fever, the chest, the windedness. Um, and I just thought, okay, it's probably a cold, but I'm gonna, you know, take precautions. Mm -hmm. And I was sharing a home with my older sister and she got sick. Um, mm -hmm. And she had a similar set of symptoms. And my daughter got sick first, who's 12. So we think we passed it in the household. And neighbors were sick, you know. So there yeah. was actually this kind of low level um, discussion in, in the area we were living in Cambridge about whether we all had COVID, but none of us could ever get tested. By the, the first test I had was for antibodies in August of 2020 when I returned to the United States and it came back negative. And I've had two COVID tests and they've both come back negative. So I fall into that camp of, of uncertainty. And, um, and it's, you know, I teach these things myself. You know, sure. it's, there's a difference between having a disease and having a named disease. And, you know, so I can't even say, I know, you know, I've been tested and it's definite. But what I will say is that from, you know, April through August, I had three different episodes where for about a week to 10 days each, I could not get out of bed. I was so exhausted. The fatigue I experienced was like nothing I've ever experienced before. And I'm a pretty resilient person. Um, I, I used to jog all the time. I'm not incredibly unhealthy. And I, I just was exhausted. And that has continued 
sporadically. I have only had, I think, two since I returned to the States mm -hmm. um, in the fall and one over winter into January. Um, all of my winter break, I was just flat out. But the problem mm -hmm. with me is I'm flat out in bed working on my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So I never stopped working. Thank you. Um, and that takes its toll too. And um, I mean, what I would say about what I suspect is long COVID of the mildest sort, um, it's very, I'm reminded of the 19th century cures, you know, rest, sunlight, you know, relaxing activities. I go, I, whenever I can, I try to walk, you know, yeah. I try to walk for as much as an hour. And it's the kind of thing where re rehabilitation comes from action, you know, an activity. Right. And so any time I have an opportunity to be active, I take it. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's difficult because if I did depend on, in, uh, you know, disability, or if I did need time off, I, I'm illegible to, to systems. And many people are going to be illegible if they don't test positive. And that's something that I've seen. And I hope I'm, I'm actually, I don't know when I'll be vaccinated, but I suspect sometime by the summer. Mm -hmm. And if I can get vaccinated, they do say that um, I've read some, some reports now that people who with long COVID symptoms get some benefit improvements. Yeah. So I'll be my own guinea pig. Um, and see. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And that uncanny experience that others have described on COVID calls of being an expert in these areas and then living through it and, mm -hmm. and trying to process that. Um, I, one of my, the great things for me about doing this project is I get to talk to my intellectual heroes. And that's certainly true today. Uh, just thank you for this time, Helen, just reminding everybody that you've been listening to COVID calls and been talking with historian of medicine, Helen Tilly today. And a reminder, you can catch COVID calls live every weekday, 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. Tomorrow, I'll be talking to Adler Planetarium uh, astronomer Lucianne Walkowitz. And so please join me for that. And you can check her out. She's sort of a TED superstar. You can check out some of Lucianne's videos on TED. So please join me for that tomorrow, 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. And Helen, thanks again for your time. We really covered a lot of ground today. And I appreciate your time and all the work you're doing right now. Thank you so much, Scott. And one person I forgot to mention is Monica Green, who's uh, oh. my feed on Twitter has been just such fun to follow and she's so fantastic. We've had Monica on twice and I can't yeah. wait to get her back again. Thanks, thanks okay. Helen thank and you, stay Scott. healthy everybody. We'll see you tomorrow, 5.30.